welcome to this evening's virtually speaking event. It is great to see so many of you here and especially so many of our younger alumni and current students. I did say to Pete and Ben when we chatted earlier that we are thrilled to do an event together with them as younger um, alumni and I guess they don't see themselves as that young anymore but they are our youngest panelists so far on this virtually speaking program of events. Saying that, they still have achieved an impressive amount of stuff since leaving Latima in 2001. Ben and Pete became really good friends here at school and have worked together ever since on countless charting records, including songs for Leona Lewis, Little Mix, Oli Merce and Lewis Capaldi, for whom they wrote Someone You Love, which they were nominated for Song of the Year at the 2020 Grammy Awards. So very impressive indeed. Before I hand over to Ben and Pete, a couple of housekeeping rules. Everyone will be muted during the talk. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat facility. Ben and Pete are very happy to answer as many as possible uh, as time allows at the end of the talk. Also, due to the current lockdown rules, Ben and Pete can't be in the same room as originally planned tonight and have therefore pre-recorded this, but they are, as you have heard, here with us live um, and will be live for the Q&A afterwards, so all, all good. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to Pete and Ben. Hello guys, nice to see you all. Uh, we won't do a massive intro because we basically put that on the video, but yeah, just so I'd say, lovely to see you all. Um, everyone is welcome to ask us some questions other than uh, whoever Daffy's hat may be and Alexander Cookman. Uh, apparently you, you guys are banned from asking questions, just so you know, uh, just, uh, just in case you feel like it might be funny afterwards. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoy it. It's slightly uh, badly edited. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it will be interesting to all of you and you can find out a little bit about what we do. So yeah, here we go. Hi guys, welcome to our webinar. Uh, we are TMS, or we should say we're two thirds of TMS. I am Ben and this is Murph. Uh, and we're missing today Fro uh, because he didn't get let into Latima, but I guess the less said about that, the better. Uh, but yes, normally we are three and doing anything as a two feels very strange to us. So uh, if we fluff up on some of the details today, you have to forgive us. Um, we should say, welcome to our bedrooms. Uh, obviously the more glamorous bedroom which is mine and the slightly you know boring plain dull bedroom that's Murph's going on there uh, and we apologize we can't do this in person and we've pre-recorded it but uh, due to like the technical problems of lockdown and playing audio and all the rest of it we decided that we would uh, re-record this for you guys um, pre-record this for you guys so we hope that it is okay and you mind the dodgy editing because we're good music producers and we're good songwriters and we're not great video editors. So uh, forgive us any slightly weird technical hitches we have today. Yeah, um, sorry. I mean, it's, it's uh, strange times we live in and it's really fun doing this, but uh, we're going to play some audio clips, some bits of video. And so we figured with our limited experience in this realm, we pre-record it. I should explain, this is, it was my uh, 38th birthday yesterday, embarrassingly enough. God, that's a large number. And these decorations are left up from a Zoom karaoke night. So I thought, why not make use of them? Look like some kind of bingo hall. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Thank you. We feel honored to be asked to do this. And we're going to try and uh, make what we do for a living sound entertaining. Uh, not just like a lot of people sat around in a room drinking tea and bouncing bad ideas back and forth. We're going we're gonna to take you behind the curtain into the magic, looking at a couple of songs that we've been lucky enough to be involved with that have gone on to be pretty sizable hits. Um, we've done this a couple of times before. I think we should probably say a little bit about Latima as well. Um, we obviously both being ex pupils, um, and I think it says something about the strength of music at Latima that we can both be sitting here doing this now. Um, I remember when we were there, there was no music tech course, and uh, I feel uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel we kind of bullied the school into creating a music tech department, um, and uh, we were the first guys to have a studio in Latima and be able to do music tech as an A level. And I think it's fair to say that it's paid off pretty well. Um, yeah. So thank you, Latimer, because without that, I wouldn't know this guy and my life would be very, very different. So yeah, yeah thanks for I that. Think, I think you remember correctly, uh, the room that we had the lessons in is the 
Suzuki room. It's on the corner of the school, on the corner of King Street, on the left-hand side. I walk past it quite often, and it's the little glass conservatory that was used as, it's got a kind of plaque on it talking about some Suzuki thing. Uh, that's not for yeah, us, though, right? Plaque's not for <laughs> us, no. No, the songs have not done that well. Uh, and one, one other memory I have is of doing a music tech concert in the what was then the new theatre at the school. Uh, performing some of our performing some of our records, miming some of our records, and having a lot of fun doing that. So yeah, it was they were really they were obviously formative years. I mean, we've worked together since then uh, in in you know doing what we're doing now, and luckily, eventually, successfully, uh, we'll take you through how we are managing to do it successfully over the next uh, forty five minutes or so. So without further ado, we're going to start with. Uh, a record we've had out in the last couple of years that's probably been one of our most successful records. It's with a Scottish singer called Lewis Capaldi, and the song is called Someone You Loved. It came out in late 2017, and uh, I guess the pinnacle for this record is quite interesting to see where, you know, why we're talking about this record in case you haven't heard it or weren't aware of it. Kind of nice to show it where it finally ended up, which was nominated for Song of the Year at the 2020 Grammy Awards and was actually used. Um, during the introduction to the Grammys by Alicia Keys, who rewrote the lyrics uh, to take, uh, taking aim at the, at the celebrities in the audience. And it just was a, an amazing moment. We were sat there in row five, in a kind of suited and booted and couldn't really believe what was happening to us. So here is that clip. So I wanna show some love to some of the artists that spoke this language so beautifully with us this year. So I got something for you. Here we, here we go, here we go, here we go. Rosalia's hot Beyonce took us all on safari. Hey B, thank you for that orange box. That was really fire. We obsessed about BTS, her and Louis Capaldi. Hey Lou, is it cool that I'm using your song right now? Is that all right? Okay, thumbs up. Jonas Brothers return. Billy and Phineas, Camila like Sean, to call her Senorita, Ariana went next, Tyler brought us Igor, Little Nas broke that road till he couldn't no more. It's the Grammys, gonna have a ball, and here's Alicia Keys to get you through. Right, Matt, so let's try and remember where it started for this song. So I can tell you that the date was uh, August 2018. And we'd worked uh, with Lewis Capaldi, introduced through, uh, through our management team. Uh, he was signed to Virgin Records, and he was one of the people that we were booked in to work with uh, earlier in the year. And we had a good rapport. We did a couple of songs that people seemed to like, you know, nothing that ever... Uh, actually made it out into the world uh, but it felt like a good good creative grounding and a good good kind of relationship so when there was talk about some more sessions um, we, we'd hung out a little bit I think actually in Los Angeles maybe had a you know had, had an evening out together um, when there was talking more sessions to point out at this point as well that at this point you know Lewis is starting to build his following you know, he's done some good Instagram stuff and lots of social networking things that I'm a bit too old to really understand. Uh, but by this point, you know, he, he's not nobody. He's definitely getting somewhere, but as of yet, hasn't had a hit record. But I think the one thing um, that Murph particularly really jumped on was how incredible the guy's voice was. And, you know, at those early stages, you know, look, when somebody wants to send you, you know, an artist that has already got several million followers and they've had hit records it's very easy to decide hey yeah let's write with them but what we often have to do is pick between the artists who are new and and you know there's a lot of them and you only got to watch x factor to realize how many people want to be an artist uh, and with lewis it was just straight up wow that voice is stand out at this point we had no idea how funny he was or what great personality he had really no. we knew he was a nice bloke but we hadn't seen that whole you know what everybody now sees as lewis it really was just based on his voice he'd had, and um, the fact that we picked up a nice vibe of him. You know, and he, he'd had one, I mean, it would be slightly disingenuous to say 
they all hadn't had any success because he had number one on, uh, we, we watch a lot, New Music Friday playlist, where there's one on Apple Music, there's one on uh, Spotify, and he'd had the top ranked song on there out of nowhere, which was just a vocal and piano called Bruises. Uh, so we weren't the only ones who kind of spotted that there was something happening there. And actually that record went on to inform the work that we did and, and this song, Someone You Love, because one of the things about it is it's so stripped and so minimal. Um, but we, you know, we were, we had a good thing. We felt it was a good thing going on there. So what we did was we paired, there's various people that we work with. I mean, uh, technically we would, we kind of come from a more music uh, instrumental background. Uh, and then the industry is kind of split they, between track guys, which tend to be track guys or girls, people who focus more on the instrumentation, drums, instruments, chords, that kind of stuff. And on the other side, top line guys and girls who are more vocal focused. And actually the lines are really blurred. Sometimes they're not blurred. Sometimes it's, they're very defined and sometimes they are quite blurred. Um, but we still are, are more comfortable coming from a production music kind of background. So in this instance, we had a, it was us, Lewis, and then a third party, which is a friend of ours called Sam Romans, who's a Londoner, a beautiful singing voice we've written many songs with. And, uh, and so we all, we're all booked in to meet up at our studio midday uh, in the middle of August to see what happens. It's worth pointing out, it's completely speculative, all of the work that we do like this, because we're, we're trying to go in and create, um, a, a create you know, a copyright. No one's, there's, there's no, no one's getting paid for this. We're just meeting up as a, as a group of, of individuals to try and make something happen. And, you know, which is, the odds which is are completely horrible. Unlike, completely unlike any other business. I mean, you are, yeah. you, you, you're gambling. Every, every day you're gambling. And we kind of, to kind of elaborate on that, you know, we do 250 songs a year. You know, uh, a lot of them start with this kind of speculative thing. And, you know, the truth of our industry is you get paid for, you know, one in 200 things that you do. Um, and so that was kind of standard. So we were all booked to turn up um, in the middle of August. Uh, we start our sessions at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. We are quite in the, uh, in the spectrum of people doing what we do. We, have, we are all dads now, but we have been for quite a while on the family end of the spectrum. <laughs> Lots of people have different nocturnal working habits, and we did maybe in our teens a little bit. But we, we, Americans that we work with say that we have a Nashville kind of uh, rhythm, which basically means we come in, you know, under normal office hours and we leave normal office hours. We do, we tend to do nine in the morning until 6.30 with sessions starting at 12. You, you might say we're really, really rock and roll. Yeah, it's, it's not very rock and roll. In, in general, you know, the kind of like, there, there are people who don't, wouldn't start until 6.30 p.m. And we've had sessions, we've been asked to turn up, you know, late into the night and work all through. Uh, we personally find it's not sustainable, like it's not sustainable physically and for your own uh, mental health. It's also not sustainable once you have families and stuff like that. So 12 o'clock start time, we get together uh, in, our, in our room, which, was, uh, which at the time was in Chiswick. And uh, we, one of the standout features of this day in particular was, was, and something that we subsequently, we always did it a bit and we, we always try and do it now, is to do more than one idea. So it was a two song day. So we spent the first part of the day writing a song called uh, Put Me Down or something like that, that never saw the light of day and will never see the light of day. And the, one of the funny bits about this day is that at various points, we thought the other one might have been the, the smash hit that you'll, you'll hear in a second. So about a couple of hours into the session, Lewis isn't, it, it's, you know, it's not, it's not completely making his buzzer blow uh and you can kind of read the read that in the chemistry so had the idea to maybe put the first song down for a little bit and let's let's try something else let's see what's the complete opposite of the song that we've been working on and uh so lewis sits down at the piano and out of the swamp uh, if i'm going to play a couple of recordings here i guess uh some of these clips are going to be definitely quite boring but the point of that clip was to show how boring <laughs> <laughs> to show how uh, <laughs> incoherent and uh, what, uh, what a hot mess it could be at various times. But that was the first time you hear Lewis going, oh, something. He actually, he had had uh, a couple of melodies that he'd been knocking around, which I'll now play the other recording. You can hear what he had. 
And uh, that was just his brain just remembering, you know, he's just putting his hands on the piano and seeing what comes back. And he thought, okay, how about this little thing I had knocking around, which is a great way to start. Uh, a session. Yeah. It's one of the things. I'll, know, inter I'll interject yeah. and say, yes, that, that's, that's the dream. That's uh, what we call laying a golden egg. What you're about to hear is laying a golden egg. It's uh, somebody coming in with an amazing idea. Uh, and then we, our job is, our job in theory is to, to, to birth that egg, shall we say. Often, when you listen back to these recordings, what you do realize is that you're doing everything you can to stand in the way of it actually being as good as it turns out to be in the end. <laughs> well, this, but, I mean, this, uh, but this we're song, trying our best. <laughs> I think th this is an example of of being able to being able to get out of our own way, as you you were here. Yeah, this this is one of those occasions where it's like the less at this point in the process, less is more. I think it's just what you're seeing is that. It's just, it really is, I can't emphasize it enough, it, enough. It's, it's just daring to fail, basically. It's, it's somebody, you know, in this case, Lewis, and it could have been anybody in that room. Uh, it just happens that he's got the great voice, so let the guy fucking do his thing, you know, and he's just singing, and, and we're essentially encouraging him along, you know, um, and, you know, it's what's the most important bit there? It's, it's impossible to say, but it's, it's all alchemy, and it's all, you know, it can be when you've done this enough you realize that anybody can have their day and, and you try to learn to recognize if someone's doing something good and and you just let them do something good because you know we can all write seven out of ten eight out of ten songs every single day but that kind of bit of magic is hard to find and when you think you're hearing it it really is important to get out of the way now i don't know whether we felt that at the time but it certainly yeah. felt like well that's pretty awesome yeah i i would say i don't want to do a disservice but i don't think you just do good work. There's no, we didn't, at this stage, you're sitting there, someone sung a nice melody, you're not thinking, I hope one day we're sat at the Grammys listening to this. You know, you just, you, you just do good work. You do professional, clean, like, you know, work it, try and do your best at every decision. And then, and then that gets you there. Um, but yeah, it doesn't. It's definitely fun listening back to it though. <laughs> yeah. uh, then, uh, so that's relatively quick. I mean, the whole song's pretty quick to be honest. That's about half an hour's worth of like, Lewis has, has kind of got on the piano, he's played a couple of melodies, he's finished off his own melody and we're just kind of sitting listening to him at this stage. Then there's a couple of hours of, of lyric, which is a bit more of a grind. It still was quick on this occasion. Here's uh, Romans picking the title out of the end of one of Lewis's kind of goes round. So we, what we're probably doing is we're listening to like one of us playing instruments, like Lewis sing over it, Roman sing over it, and trying to pick lyrics out of the kind of sludge a little bit. I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to write lyrics. You can write towards a title. You can talk, uh, other sessions will be in, someone will bear their soul uh, and there'll be a story in mind and then we'll try and write their story. Sometimes there'll be a title where it's like, this is, a, this is kind of what I want to write towards and we'll try and work that out. Other times, I'd say probably more often people tend to sing uh, la la lyrics, which is just a way of just saying like bend it on the guitar, kind of slight gobbledygook, and then try and extract from the sound, the vowel sounds and the consonants and what 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 would fit there. And from that, you tr you get a little skeleton and you just expand upon that. Is that fair enough? Yeah. That seems to be the way it works most of the time. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the features of this song is that it came in very late in Lewis's album process. He's, he'd, he'd almost finished his first album. And along with the album, he'd also almost finished his budget for that album. Uh, so it, it, it's a classic story of make do, uh, of, of, uh, of, of kind of creative choices born out of not having a lot of options. Uh, you know, it's, it's that story, which is great. I love it. So we, we weren't in a position where we could pile on the production. So normally at that's the stage when we've got the song and we've been told that it's commissioned and we're ready to go, we'll spend some money on it. You know, we'll record strings, choirs, we'll try stuff out, we'll have session musicians, da 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 da, da. This time, time was tight. You know, it was, it was, it need, they needed a quick turnaround and there wasn't a budget to do any bells and whistles. So it was pretty minimal what we did after the session. We tried lots of stuff out, like tried kind of, experimented with different sounds and we ended up always coming back to this kind of the sound from the day which uh which had some interesting production choices i've pulled out there's, there's only about seven sounds in it and i pulled out one of the weirder sounds because it's not a sound that you would expect to have in a strip piano ballad like this it's a processed vocal harmony 
um, which is kind of, I mean, it's quite, it's kind of a contemporary sound, but it's not something that you would expect to hear in a stripped piano ballad. I think it's fair enough. I'll just try and find it on the last chorus. <laughs> So that's the only BV part that's in the song. It's a it's a BV jungle backing vocal. Backing vocal. Oh, it's a it's a it's a jungle bass, so a kind of dance music influenced uh, bass sound. Uh, there's the kind of piano. We we did record. We did have someone uh, produce a string arrangement, but actually when we laid it on, it just it just made the record sound too sweet and too obvious. So we ended up just using a tiny snippet of it. Uh, I think this is um, an important point here is this, this is one of the things about Lewis's voice is so powerful. You kind of yeah. don't need a lot of stuff, sort of, like, a lot of the time, but, you know, it's, it's very chill. I mean, the yeah. irony of, of spending, you know, 25 years learning our craft and making songs with, you know, like Wings for Little Mix, which had every bell and whistle you could possibly throw at it. And, you know, I, I think it's fair to say our biggest song was literally piano, bass, weird little harmony part. Mm -hmm. And, and a touch of strings in the middle eight, I seem to remember. Yeah, yeah that was from the string agent. Uh, yeah, I think I think you're right about Lewis's voice. It's heavily compressed, his voice. It fills up a lot of space. And credit where it's due, I think that does come from the record that we mentioned, Bruises, which was his initial kind of uh, first record that he had released out, which was incredibly minimal and just showed what you can do. Uh, so, yeah, no budget. Didn't uh, In our industry, we tend to have things mixed by an engineer before they're could they go off to be commercially released but in this instance there was no budget for the late from the label for mix so we ended up mixing the record ourselves uh and we even did did lewis a deal on the uh on the eventual fee because you know there was there was no money left there really um but we just we were really into it we were really into him uh and then uh, before we know it the Thank record God went we out yeah record <laughs> <laughs> so that was so that was all done in in august and i think the records we're finishing the record in november and then it goes out just before christmas on an ep it wasn't even on his album it was on an ep that was kind of a a setup for the album i suppose uh and i guess this is where the um this is where the new world of streaming really uh helps us because once the record's out it just grows uh takes a life of its own i think it's fair to say it, it was a, it, it got a reasonably high placing on a, on the new music playlists again it, it you know i think it was like 15 or something in the uk mm -hmm. uh but it just kind of grew and grew uh organically out the time, in the world. yeah it, 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 especially in america i think these things happen very slowly i mean i think this is a particularly slow record like this took you know the best part of a year i think to get to number one out there um, and I think it actually has, it has some kind of record of the longest ascent to number one of any record or something like that, which is great because, you know, slow up, slow down. Um, but yeah, it really, it, it's a different world. When we first started making records, when we first started making successful records, you would front load the chart. So um, they, you know, the radio would play it and play it and play it and play it and they'd have six or seven or eight weeks of playing a record. Uh, and then you would do pre-orders and, you know, no one would, you know, they, they, they build the fever and build the fever and build the fever. And then, you know, basically the weekend before they released it, you kind of knew you were going to be number one because they would put the record out and you'd know, oh, we had 50,000 pre-sales and, you know, there's this much demand and all the rest of it. And you would know that's actually number one. Then the radio companies and the streaming companies and the record companies all got together and said, well, look, how can we stop people trying to like pirate the records? And quite sensibly, they turned around and said, well, if you put them out when they're on the radio, then people won't have such a, a reason to want to nick them. Um, and so that's what they did. They did something called On Air On Demand. And what it meant was that, you know, you could buy the record the minute you heard it on radio or stream the record the minute you heard it on radio. So those kind of things together meant that the new way of doing things is much, much, so, you know, obviously if you've got a huge, huge American artist, they can still go to number one the weekend, they put it out. But most records, especially with new artists, you know, they take six months a year to build yeah. up to where they get. So I actually just Googled, I forgot. So it went, it, it, it was released in, November, let's say, it went number one in the UK in March, so that's five months, and it went number one in the US in October of the following year, so almost a full year after release. Uh, it's just an amazing journey. I mean, it's having now been involved, I think that was the first record of ours that, that really had that, that journey. Like Ben says, it had all been a little bit more up and down the, pre in the previous kind of chart structure. Uh, having now been involved, it was a hell of a ride. 
I mean, it's amazing to check back every, <laughs> every week for a year and see it slowly progressing, you know, up and up and up and up was absolutely incredible to watch. And, and also the rise of Lewis at the, at, you know, over that same period was insane. I mean, within, if, if the, by the time the record had come out, you know, we'd gone to see him in some live shows and seen what an amazing performer he was and how charismatic and funny he is. And then, you know, the, the world for him just totally changed over that, that time period. I mean, it was literally insane to, to ride alongside uh, that. And uh, I guess ultimately, so if it was number one in October in the US, Ben, then the, yeah. the Grammy announcement can't have been too far after that. I think, I think with these kind of award with the award runs you have to be really lucky with timing and i think we were lucky with timing with this so yeah we got grammy announcement in november so we were then over there in february 2020 so we're now a year i don't know almost a year and four months after the release of it we're still talking about this record we're still getting suits fitted and getting ready to go to the ball uh and i guess that was really the peak um moment for it that was an amazing experience and uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy when you think back to the recording we played you at the beginning, which is a man going ding, ding, ding on a piano, not quite sure what to play, how it's going to come out and where it's going to go and all those things. So um, if nothing else, I think this song is a lesson of just go with the flow. You never know where something's going to end up and, uh, and you never know the, the smallest little moment in a studio or in life is, is going to totally change your life. And uh, as much success as we'd had before this record, I think this record definitely changed all of our lives. Uh, so yeah, I hope you've enjoyed that anyway. Uh, I hope you haven't joined on for too long. Um, and we hope that the quality of this is going to work because if we have to re-record all this again, it's going to be really upsetting. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, uh, I think we're going to come in live now and uh, take any of your questions. Yeah, we actually plan to do more than one song, but it's the first time we've gone through a lot of that. Uh, so we may have droned on a little bit. I hope it was some of it was interesting. <laughs> no, that was um, it was it was uh, really great. I mean, really fascinating and I think insightful. Um, and I guess you know, so many times you hear these amazing records on um, radio and, and and Spotify, and you don't realize the amount of work that kind of goes on um, behind kind of creating them. So so really really um, interesting. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, I think we're gonna um, do a Q and A. So if you, you know, if anyone has any questions, please do type them in the chat, um, and we'll kind of just just work through them. I might kick start and just because um, I'm just interested. So when you kind of met them when you were at Latima, was this a dream already then? Um, so, um, yeah, yeah I, think, I think the truth is it was. Yeah, I think um, we we bonded over music. I think me and we met in the prep, right? Murphy was, I think we were seven, uh, and I seem to remember like somewhere around the age of like eleven. I everyone was a DJ back then. I kind of feel like they still are. And we bought some decks, and I played the guitar, and Murphy played. What did you say? I can't remember. The tuba or something? Tuba with Mr. Humbert. I, I played trumpet, but I was relegated to the tuba. I think they needed a tuba, basically. Yeah. And I didn't practice the trumpet that much, so I got the tuba. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, we used to get around each other's houses and we would, we would mix and, and we would, you know, we'd have these decks and we'd be trying to like put different vocals onto different tunes. And we very quickly realized that what we wanted to do was actually kind of get in a bit deeper and start to try and make some of those records. And this was like, I mean, 11, 12 years old kind of thing. So yeah, and you know, I think by the time we were 16, we, we kind of built this, the music shed which is what tms stands for which was a shed in a in a car park in ealing and and the idea was just sort of like you know we i had a, i had a computer no so murph had a computer i had a keyboard we had all these bits and we thought well if we could find somewhere to put them together then we'll actually have some kind of you know studio or like a rudimentary studio and that's what we did we did it a lot of phil there actually that, that's probably the standout because it's quite common now we're a bit older we've got friends who've got kids who are kind of approaching you know the age that we might have been when we started thinking about this and it's quite a common thing to be interested in uh this the standout thing is that we've been able to stay together as long as we have and stay doing it really was uh, is, uh, is pretty incredible i do have one memory of us ben and i did music gcse together and we handed in some homework that we we were supposed to create a piece of music or something and we bootlegged like a house of pain instrumental He's sitting and right there man. Handed, Don't tell him. <laughs> handed it in on, on tape and in that day in that day and age and uh 
and it was marked and given back to us. And I remember coming out of the old music block and being so happy to get our hands back on the contraband that we pushed, unspooled the tape so that the evidence was destroyed and put it in bin there and then. Uh, so we were scheming and, you know, and thinking along those lines even then. That would have been at 50. And... What's funny is that we never really had a massive ambition to be artists. I think that, that was also quite unique. We, we recognised very early on that none of us had particularly great voices or any kind of stage presence. And it was just very much like, okay, songwriter, producer. We kind of flirted with, with DJing and doing that part of it because, you know, essentially you could just sort of, you were kind of as close to being in front of the stage as you could be while still being behind the scenes. But really it was always about the studio for us. It was all really Latin, As you would know, Latin's got a bit of a heritage in that department. There's other alumni, people who've gone on from the years around us to do bands and to DJ really successfully. I think it's probably part of it being a, a you know, the zone three, zone two central London school. So growing up there, you're mixing already in those pools. And, and that was a, definitely a big part of it for us. We were, we, you know, we, we were already where we needed to be. We said to do it for long enough that eventually, you know, the industry was just there for us. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, I think we have a question from Ian. I don't know if you want to, Unmute yourself, Ian, and, and ask your question. Um, well, uh, uh, the obvious question to ask is, so, so who got the songwriting credits? Because it seems to me that nobody really wrote that song. <laughs> Welcome to modern songwriting. Um, so the simple answer is that we all split the credits. Uh, what happens in a modern songwriting context is that essentially you split it by whoever's in the room, who's kind of, you know, you're not gonna give the guy that's coming to take pictures credits on there, but yeah, essentially everybody got the songwriting credits. So what you don't really hear is the, on those records, you hear Lewis doing the, wow, he's just sang a melody bit, but what you don't hear is the kind of two hours worth of like, writing the lyrics and and adjusting the melody. And and I also think this is kind of a unique situation where Lewis really did have quite a chunk of that melody. In other situations, you'll tend to be doing, you know, Murph might do the verse and I might do a bit of the chorus and then we all come together and hash out the lyric together and all the rest of it. So the, yeah, the, what you tend to do is split the songwriting credit. So yeah, we head off to the royalty. Yeah, he's he's in the room. And, and, <laughs> and in a longer creative relationship, there's lots of different types of songs that we write together. So there are other songs we've done with Lewis, like the, there's one that's top 20 in the US at the moment called Before You Go, which is which we we kind of contribute more to, you know, so it evens itself out over the run of it. But I think that everyone appreciates that uh, one person sat on their own in their shed at the bottom of the garden, it's hard to deliver that. It's hard to, to, to consistently turn that into, um, into the product that they need. That's why people like us exist, because we kind of give them the environment and the structure to come and kind of push it through and deliver what, yeah. what's, gonna, what's gonna change. change There's them. different levels of it. You have, you know, Lewis, he's a, a brilliant songwriter and what he's there for is like Merv says, is to, to help him along. Uh, and then you have, you know, when we're doing little mix records where, you know, basically we write it for them, you know? So it just kind of depends on who you're with and, and we call it best supporting actor. What you learn as a, as a producer and a songwriter is the best thing that you can do is what that person needs on the day. You know, if they need you to write the song, you write the song. If they need you just to kind of give them encouragement and tell them that it's good, then that's what you do. And, and the worst kind of producers are the ones that kind of try and get their aura in on everything. And actually what you really want to do is, is sit back and work out what's good, what's bad, and where does this person need help? It's pretty much the, the basis for what we do. Right. Uh, um, we have a question from Fidelma. I don't know if that's your, your name, but um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, oh yeah, how you would advise a young producer to get into the industry? Uh, I think that it is the best thing to concentrate on what you're doing and try and make that as good as possible, which we did for a long, long time. That's definitely part of it. There were some shortcuts that we probably could have taken by meeting the right people, talking to the right people that we definitely didn't take. Uh, so it's, it's within those two things. What the, your, the thing you can control is what you do, your skill set, how you're working. There's so much information out there now on the internet uh, that we're constantly consuming. Because to be honest, the job is changing as technology changes. We have to adapt and learn new skills. So we're consuming the same thing everyone else is. And 
bits of software, tips and tricks, that kind of stuff. And then the other half is, is yeah, being aware of what the industry is, which maybe we didn't work too sharp on uh, at the start, you know, what the industry is, how it works, who's out there. We, we eventually, by the time we were 17, 18, we'd met a manager. He was quite junior at that stage too. It took us a long time to kind of blood ourselves. Uh, probably the, the biggest waste of time was, was pressing our own dance music release on a 12 inch vinyl and uh, putting a giant A to Z map on the wall of our shed with pins where each of the record shops were in the greater London area. And then each driving off in our, in our banged up cars, so this is pretty much just after school to hand deliver these records on uh, it was called sale and return. So you don't get paid until you come back to pick up the money. We realized that they not really sold enough to cover the petrol to go and pick them up. So it was just a fool's errand. But so yeah, those two halves, does that sound fair enough, Pete? Yeah, I would also yeah. say that my, my advice is, um, try and write a song a day um, and that sounds kind of crazy but I think that one of the big mistakes uh, a young producer does is they write one song and they produce it up and they spend four weeks producing it up and then they do another one and they get to about their sixth song and then they go right let's find someone let's give them this demo let's see what we can do and yeah. uh, and you know eventually it maybe if you're lucky it finds its way into the hands of a record guy or someone like us or whoever like that and our thing is okay that's great you've got six songs what else have you got you know and I think that you know, we've written tens of thousands of songs in our career. Uh, and we can, you know, yes, we've been lucky enough to have, I don't know, I think it's eight number ones, nine number ones now. And, but it's, you know, that's nine out of thousands and thousands of songs. And the thing I try and really get into people's heads is just don't get stuck on your first six songs and then spend months and months producing them up. Just keep writing songs every day. Do another one, do another one, do another one. So when you get to someone like us, and they say, well, what else have you got? You can say, well, actually, here's another 200 of the things. And then it's like, wow, this, this kid's been working. This guy's really actually thinking. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good point. I mean, it's the, the failure rate we discussed. You know, we will we'll do three sessions a week. We'll try and write two songs a day. So let's say on a good week, that's six songs at the end. And we'll kind of know. We'll enjoy the process. That's the most important thing. But we'll know that those songs probably aren't ever going to go anywhere. As much as we're trying every day to get it, you've got to get the perfect run of, the right artist, the right song, doing all the right pitch opportunities, so many things. So you've got to get used to that idea that you're constantly working, constantly turning stuff out and not getting stuck too much on, uh, on any, in any one idea, on any one kind of song. Yeah. Um, Aniel, do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, it's been really great to see what you guys have been up to since we were all at school together. So um, thank Hi, you. Aniel. Right. Seat, mate. <laughs> oh yeah um so yeah i had a question really because i mean obviously you do a lot of songs for a lot of artists um like do you tend to write the song specifically for the artist in mind and to what extent do the artists get involved in that creative process um I, I kind of like we said before it just totally depends on the artist um so we had an artist in recently, a young girl, and you know, you're know you kind of playing psychologist. So they'll come in, they'll tell you all about their life, all about their boyfriends, all about whatever's going on. Um, because remember, we're not writing songs for ourselves, we're writing songs for people and it's got to be believable. So we've got to try and interpret what's going on in their life. So, you know, she might come in, her part of the songwriting process may be literally just to tell us a story about her boyfriend that flags an idea and then we off we go and we try and put it into a way that sounds believable for her. So that may be one particular type of thing. And then obviously what you've heard with Lewis is where, you know, it's kind of the other way around. He's come in with a fantastic idea and, and we've got to try and help him see, see it through. So it just really depends. I it say it, it, uh, it is quite rare, like pitching records at people who haven't had an involvement in them is, is people say it's more rewarding. Like you get bigger hits that way. I've heard lots of people say that, but it's much longer odds. I mean, we've had some success with it. I mean, one of the biggest records at the start of our career was a record called Read All About It, which was a, which was a girl called Emily Sande. One of the ones we thought about talking about because it ended up as uh, at the Olympics on the kind of um, opening ceremony that we performed. Uh, and that was a pitch record that we'd written with a friend of ours who was a professional songwriter. The artist wasn't involved and we packaged that up and then pitched it. And so it, it can work, but it's like threading the eye of a needle you know you've got to be really lucky that it ends up with the right people and that essentially I, I guess that the artist at the end of it has ownership feels like they have ownership over it that it's, that it's speaking to them or telling their story in some way uh yeah cool thanks 
Nice to see you. You too. Phil, do you want to unmute and ask a question? So yeah, you've missed Rory out. Do you want to go him first? What have I missed? Oh, sorry. Well, Phil, we do you and then we go back. Yeah. Okay. I think they're pretty similar questions anyway, but um, just you said that your journey started at Latimer and then Murph said, and actually he's made a few references to it, but eventual success. So I was just wondering, um, you know, at what point did you think you were successful and how long did it take you to get there? Um, <laughs> well, first of all, you probably know because I saw you last week. Um, <laughs> well, there's, there's, you know, young budding yeah. producers here that would love to know. <laughs> um, we, uh, when did we I start? Say, it, it, it came at a rush, really, didn't it? Because there was, we, we had an, an early period where we had some stuff cooking, but it was really around 2011 when we just were very lucky to get two number one records in the space of a month or something at the end of that year. And we've been working up to that point, but I think that's a huge validation for what you're doing. I mean, we had a handful of records that had succeeded commercially in the UK, but that was that, that definitely put us on the map. And after that point, it was more a case of picking what we were doing rather than trying to find something to do. It was useful. Definitely, if you rewound that a year, we would have just been looking for stuff to stay busy and trying to make something happen. But that was kind of a tipping point. I mean, I think it's interesting as well, Phil, like, because, you know, you, I mean, you, you know, it really was like, it was, people bit say overnight success because they only see the pivot point. Um, but as you know, like we've been, you know, all of us together have been working since we were like so young. So the actual, yeah, the, the, the point of like, you get that number one and then the world suddenly goes, oh, oh where, who are you guys? You know, and that, that was definitely a moment where it felt like, wow, this might, this might be something we can actually do. Um, but, uh, but up until that point, they're very much, it's, it's funny because you, you start to wonder, is this ever, we were, I think I was 27 when we had our first number one and, and you definitely doubt yourself and wonder, you know, is this ever going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? Suddenly it does. And then you're like, oh God, now we've got to do it again. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing really. I don't know if you ever feel like you've made it, if that's the question. I don't think you ever feel like, hey, I think, uh, imposter syndrome is, is very much a real thing. I think a lot of the time you feel like someone's going to catch you out and make you, you know, suddenly you're going to realise that. And it yeah, probably, oh, actually, oh, I am crap at this all along, I kind of knew it. <laughs> the rhythm of our job probably doesn't help with that because the gaps between releases can be huge, you know, the, because it's the odds are so long and you're kind of punting for these one in a 500 opportunities, you know, it can be a year, year and a half between kind of something substantial that comes along. And that's just the nature of the beast. So, yeah, there's definitely a bit of self-doubt kind of floating around in there. But just for me, I think that's what's impressive and I think really what I'm trying to get the younger people to understand is that it was 10 years after you left Latimer and I think one of the most impressive things is like the resilience and your, and your self-belief despite your self-doubt when everyone else was building careers and people were saying, oh, it's time for you to get a proper job and, you know, you're still living with your parents and all of that where everyone else was getting their own places and you stuck with it and, and paid dividends. And I think a lot of young people will be rushing, thinking, oh, I'm 18, 19 and haven't made it. But that's not, that's not real. That's, but uh, you guys yeah. personified that, really. That's very kind of you. I don't think that would have happened if we weren't in a group. That is another interesting component of it, to go back to the earlier question, is that it was a lot easier doing it with friends and doing it in it with a kind of sense of camaraderie and kind of, you know, cajoling each other forward. No one, you know, that, that definitely made that more possible. I'm not yeah. sure I can imagine doing it on my own. Um, we have, um, I know we, I'm conscious of time, I know we are at eight, but um, at eight, but we have three more questions, um, Pete, Ben, if you're happy to kind of just keep keep going for a little bit longer. Yeah. Be okay. yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I skipped you earlier, so I'll, I'll come back to you. Do you want to, you want to ask your question? No worries, no worries. Um, hey guys, so when did you make the jump to day job and living off it and then after that when did you make the jump to sort of publishing contract or meeting up with sort of the successful acts uh i mean like phil says so yeah the first hit we had was 27 and like phil said we were, we were literally living at home with our parents so i think me and murph were really lucky in that respect and that we had basically support parents so we we lived at home uh and uh luckily enough they kind of believed in us um so we weren't worrying about a roof over our heads it's honest truth to that 
Um, and then I think that uh, Fro, who's the third of us, who did have to worry about that, we basically, we would DJ, uh, we had a bit of a dance act going on. Um, you know, we were sort of getting, you know, a few hundred quid for a gig, you know, up to maybe 500 pounds for a gig. And we basically were just giving that to Fro so that he could survive through it too. Uh, with the idea that, hey, one day we might make this successful and, and, and you can pay us back. Um, and uh, and it was, it was we sort of well. jump. I don't think if no, there was ever a jump. We had we had a one of our mates happened to work uh, in. I don't know how he got. How did Paul get the job in the man in the record company? I, th well, I think that probably the in two thousand and nine we signed our first publishing deal. So that was still two years out from any success, and that happened because of our involvement with Paul, who was a professional manager who knew who, who was kind of making his way in the industry, and that that laid. The groundwork those two years and then it seemed to be it, it, the publishing deal is when someone you, you you do a deal with a corporation to collect your songwriting royalties in return for an advance and they'll collect over a period of time and they normally well we, we seem to do three-year deals and it always seemed to be that the last year of the deal we seemed to come through finally just in time before <laughs> the deal expired and we ended up looking like we'd we hadn't quite made it so that was 2009 i'd say and that and that was around that time things were starting to change you know we were we would, I would consider we were, we were picking up some production fees, which is the other part to what we do. The songwriting stuff is kind of the longer play because you're generating copyrights, you're getting paid in royalties, which take bloody ages to pay through. Uh, the production side of it is more you're manufacturing a three and a half minute record for a record company. They'll, you're still got a royalty for it, but they'll pay you a fee for that. Uh, so that that was starting to happen around that time frame. I think what people i think what people always really want to know is like i guess what your question is kind of alluding to is how do you make that flip how how does it like how do you go how do you get into the industry almost so like with our journey we had this friend paul he was literally a friend um and he somehow or other and i really don't know how he landed a job i think it was a, a girlfriend of his had a friend in a record company and he ended up basically getting a sort of t-boy essentially job at the at the record label and we basically said to him, look, you're the only person we know at a record label, so how do you fancy managing us? Uh, and so he was, you know, he went from T-Boy to PA at this record company, like PA to one of the, the bosses at the record company. And he would basically say, okay, these jobs are coming in. And he would kind of like say, look, have a go at this remix or have a go at this kind of extra little bit of production job. And I'll slip your demo into the pile and see if we get lucky. And, and we did it. We basically just kept on doing it, kept on doing it. And eventually did get lucky and, and, and got, I think our first, remix was for boy george or something like that wasn't it Matt? you remember it was pretty awful as well yeah the um, and then when would we have called it a j job accountancy like speculative accountancy forecasting in what we do is horrible and no one can ever give you a straight answer so i think that the, my advice on that was we we build up a war chest you know we, we just keep working and try not to make any and make any moves too soon and then hopefully if it all rolls back a bit you're kind of covered but it is it, it is a tricky still a tricky question because yeah. this song is a oh, i think your mic's gone there sorry every song is different so it's very hard for people to give you straight answers um but i like that that kind of idea of it's like a steam train and you're just shoveling coal and trying to keep the train moving <laughs> you know you don't worry too much about what's going on you just keep keep working keep feeding the machine Right. Bella, do you want to um, ask your question? Um, hi. I just wondering how it feels being like the person in the behind the scenes. And does it ever, ever, does it ever feel frustrating being the ones that aren't sort of the big name or the ones in the spotlight? And have you ever been interested in becoming the ones in the spotlight? I think it, all you need to do is hear us sing and you would know that that was never going to be a possibility. <laughs> um, no, it, it, I think okay very very occasionally you feel a bit annoyed when you've done a song that you think is really good and you give it to an artist and the promotion isn't there they don't really put the budget behind it and you just feel a little bit like it's a wasted song but um no i mean we've been around you know we've been lucky enough to meet you know a lot of very famous influential people and it's not a lot of fun to be quite honest i, I don't have any uh, it's not something i would ever want to do with my life you know, the idea that I couldn't go down to the shops, it would just annoy me. So no, I think the honest answer is none of us have aspirations to be an artist, uh, which is probably how we've managed to kind of keep it together and be friends. I, I think there's pluses and minuses to being famous, obviously, and it's great that they choose to do it because we can work with them. But I think our type, if, if, 
it all fell apart. I think we probably probably go back to making more kind of instrumental hip hop or noodly electronic music or the kind of stuff we probably made in our teens, which just is not commercially viable. Like our, our speaking personally, my idea of being an artist would probably be making weird electronic stuff for my own consumption. It's just about that's just it. It wouldn't be standing on stage at the Grammys belting out, you know, a power ballad. So just talking that, to you guys terrifies us. So the idea of being on stage is <laughs> absolutely terrifying. <laughs> We do have a, a, a comment, though, from uh, Mr. Henwood saying that I do remember getting beeped uh, to sing a solo in um, a <laughs> when he was about 16. So yeah, absolutely. Recording from that, I guess we have some we have some evidence. <laughs> I also remember that he was pretty terrified at the time. Yeah, I mean, I was absolutely <laughs> terrified. The music, like, the music was shaking in my hands. Uh, but so yeah it definitely wasn't for me we still do a bit of singing in the studio it's quite fun but we just do it for for like crowd effects when we're recording producing and stuff like that but yeah that was an absolutely terrifying memory in that it, it, at that same period of time as when we did this music tech concert and that that was probably closer to something that we would have probably put ourselves behind which was more kind of dance music led that kind of stuff which was great fun thank you for letting us do that mr henwood I think we have two two more questions. We're gonna um, we're gonna take them uh, before we kind of wrap up. Sam, do you want to ask yours? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, that was really inspiring hearing your story, and um, I do have about twenty questions, but um, I'm gonna be a bit selfish and ask the one that might benefit me. Um, basically, I've been a, a songwriter to art. It's, it's what I love to do. It's the only thing I think I'm good at. Um, I've got a portfolio of songs, uh, 10 of which I'm really, really proud of and believe in. I was wondering what's your advice to uh, to get them to the right people? And is there any chance I could send you an email with just three songs to get your professional advice on? Yeah, absolutely. They've got no problem with that. We'll definitely take a listen to them, 100%. Um, and it's like, uh, I guess, Ben's point was really well made earlier that it's a constant process. It's slightly different if you see yourself as an artist, actually, because that is more about body of work, getting it out there. But on your using your songwriting part of your brain, I think Ben's point was really well made. That it's an it's a daily occurrence. You know, you just keep keep going. So for the artist, it's great. You've got ten songs. That's your kind of artist pitch. But never stop writing because you just never know what's going to turn up under the next, you know, rock. Um, but yeah, we'd love to listen. Right, Ben? Anybody that's got Beatles and Kurt Cobain on their wall can definitely send us some songs. They're absolutely fine. And we've got Johnny Cash as well. Even though I don't really <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, no, of course, and that's some stuff. Uh, and and that you're doing the right thing in that. Like you know, it, it, anybody that says there isn't a massive bit of luck involved in this is lying. You know, like you, you, yeah, you've got to send, you've got to be ballsy, and you've got to do what you've done, and you've got to say, hey, can you listen to my demo? And look, nine times out of ten, in fact, I'm sorry, ninety nine times out of a hundred, it's going to come to nothing. But you know what? Like you keep going. At some point, you're going to get that one in a hundred where someone properly listens and takes it seriously, and you know, and says, "Yeah, it's great." And funny, being ready for that and it happening tends to happen at kind of the same sort of time. You know, like probably what happened to us when we were 27 years old was that we finally got good enough. You know, um, and so I think there's there's a lesson to be learned in that too. But yeah, by all means, man, we we'll, we can get you our details. No worries. Thank right. Yeah, thanks, Sam. We'll we'll make sure we will um we'll pass your your de details on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have one one final question. Pamela, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank you for um, lifting the curtain on what you do and the process behind the production of songs, which was really very interesting. Um, I know nothing about music. I just enjoy hearing it, but I was curious, um, and I think Sam actually preempted my question by asking how, how does an aspiring artist go about um, getting a song produced? I do get a lot of unsolicited tapes and emails sent to you. Um, obviously, um, you, you have to charge a fee for your, for your work. So um, is it about artists just sending things out there and trying to come to arrangements with people if they don't have any money to have records produced or do you look for artists yourselves that you think would fit your um if, if we're going to be completely honest generally by the time it gets to us it's been filtered 
quite a lot. So there'll be several processes of filtering. The, the first will be just the very nature of like social media. So if we think back to like Lewis, what we were saying at the beginning was he hadn't had major success, but what he had got already was a social media presence. Uh, you have to ask Lewis how he went from nothing to having that social media presence. I don't know, but he, he certainly had something going on. I think the, the truth of it is by the time it's filtered through our managers and the record labels and the rest of it, by the time it gets to our ears, yeah, there is there generally something going on. Uh, that's not to say that we wouldn't listen to stuff. It's just it doesn't tend to find its way through to our desktop that often, uh, which I, I presume is our manager trying to keep us focused and, and, and trying not to let us get bogged down in there. Because, you know, like you can imagine, you know, you've only got to look at the X Factor and you can see how many people there are. But we're, we also feel very much like you never know where the next thing's coming from because, uh, you know, Lewis is literally the perfect example of that. He was living uh, like with his mum and dad at the time. And yes, he had a social media presence, but you know, you would not be like, "Oh, this is the guy that's going to get you that Grammy nod," you know. So, um, yeah, yeah a lot of that. A lot, yeah, I think that's pretty eloquently put. A, a, a lot of the hard graft with that kind of stuff is done by A and R departments at major record labels, uh, who are that's their sole purpose. I mean, to varying degrees of success, they're kind of pilloried and rubbished in various sectors. But like, they're, they're artists and repertoire, and their job is to go and kind of find talent and develop it. And so a lot of what we work on is stuff that is already being looked at by A&R departments in, in neither the major independents or the major record labels. Um, that, that tends to be how it works because at least we then know there's a co-partner in it. We have dabbled in the past with, we had a, we did have a label deal with Sony back in 2013, 14, where the then chairman was, was trying to partner with, with creatives directly to, because he thought that we might have the answer. But I think actually, we're so busy doing what we do uh, that it's a specialist area. You know, you've got to really put time into it and, and go out there and, 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 and hunt. And, uh, and that wasn't where our skill set lay, it transpired. Thank you. We're getting, we're getting a few uh, WhatsApp questions coming through here. Daniel, uh, who I believe is Daffy's hat on here, has said that the Boy George record was from him. So fair enough, Dan, if we've forgotten that. Yeah, that's we'll, right. We'll to you, mate. <laughs> um, and then uh, Alex Pickman, yeah, I totally agree. I think Murph should sing that solo. So you know, um, I'm I'm there with you, mate. <laughs> a few decades later, come back for the twentieth anniversary. I'll still shake like a sixteen year old. I'm sure. <laughs> we'll do another event for that. <laughs> okay, lovely. I think um, we're gonna we're gonna. Um, wrap that up here it's been um it's been such a um insightful really uh, fascinating and i think also really kind of private um and personal um so that's been um really great thank you so much um for giving uh, your time um for us this evening um if you fancy joining us again this week on Thursday at 1 p.m., Robert Orme, uh, who's the former head of history of art here at LAFMA, will give a lunchtime lecture on how art can be magical. Robert talks are always uh, fascinating as well, so worth a watch if you are free then. If you want to register for this or catching up or any of our past events, please follow the links in the chat now. Also, if you would like to donate to our Inspiring Minds campaign, helping to expand bursary provision here at Latima, there is a link to our donation page in the chat as well. So far, these virtually speaking events have raised just over 12K since launching in July. Um, so thank you so much for your support. Okay, I think that takes us to the end of tonight's event. Um, Thank you again, Pete and um, Ben, so much uh, for tonight. And Thanks for having us. Audience, for joining and for your excellent questions. It's, uh, it's been great. Thank you so much. <laughs>